Hello, everyone. Welcome to Anderson Ranch. Uh, before I introduce myself, I'm going to say um, that, just remind everybody, all the new people who are on campus, that tomorrow we will have an orientation at 845, just general one right in this building. I'm Betsy Allen. I'm the visiting director of Ceramics and Expanded Media. And I'll be introducing the two speakers tonight. I'm very excited. Before we begin, could you take a moment to please silence your cell phones? Thank you. Anderson Ranch would like to acknowledge that our campus resides on the traditional ancestral territory of the Ute people, who called the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond their home for more than 800 years. Through our mission to promote a wide range of arts, cultures, and voices, we commit to partner with and honor the indigenous ancestors and residents of this sacred land where we learn, work, and create. Tonight's program will consist of two faculty lectures followed by a Q&A. First, I would like to introduce Abitinye Fabarale. Abitinye Fabarale is a ceramicist, sculptor, designer, and educator. His work explores cultural, spiritual, and material translations of objects, text, and symbols interpreted through a diaspora lens and abstracted around the aesthetics of craft and design. He received a BFA in ceramics from the Rhode Island School of Design and an MFA in ceramics from the Cranbrook Academy of Art. Barley's work has been exhibited at Friedman Benda Gallery in New York, David Klein Gallery in Detroit, Shoshana Wayne Gallery in Los Angeles, the Museum of African Diaspora in San Francisco, and the Korea Ceramic Foundation in Ichiyong. Barley's work was featured in the Objects USA 2020 exhibition and catalog. Barley was an ACAD fellow at the San Francisco Art Institute from 2016 to 2018. He is currently an assistant professor and the section lead of ceramics at the College for Creative Studies. Barley works and <laughs> resides in Detroit, Michigan. Please help me welcome Ebby to the stage. Hello, hello everyone. Just starting my stopwatch here. Um, I feel like I've overcommitted with the number of slides I prepared for this, so I'm just gonna go until I stop. Um, um, but yeah, thank you, Betsy, for that uh, really wonderful introduction. Um, it's been really great being here. We're about a, a week into um, our, our workshop. It's my first time at Anderson Ranch, and it really has been a pleasure. And I wanna thank Dell for the invitation to come. It's been fantastic co-teaching with you. And really all the staff here that's making um, this possible. It's been really, really special and fantastic. Um, just a little um, bit of context, a little bit of uh, background on me. So I was born in Nigeria. Um, I was there for probably less than, yeah, well, less than a year before moving to Antigua in the Caribbean. Um, lived there for about three years. My first memories were from being in the Caribbean um, and then came to the States from there. So I've lived most of my life uh, in the U.S. and kind of bounced around in the U.S. from up and down the East Coast and then across, <laughs> across America. Um, and now I live in Detroit. I, I, I settled right smack dab uh, in, the, in the middle. Um, so we've been talking about drawing a little bit in the workshop and just kind of thinking of the arc of my creative life. It really started with sketching. Um, I've always had a fascination from a very young age with line and its ability to convey uh, form and meaning. And pretty early on, um, I remember as a kid, I would like scribble on a sheet of paper um, and just kind of notice things in sort of like the web and mess of lines and realize that I saw things that other people didn't. And that was kind of like this affirmation that I was a creative um, person, at least to me. It wasn't until about uh, high school um, when I just kind of got this urge, this conviction to create things that could exist in space with the kind of dynamic nature, the kind of agency that people do. And I remember really thinking about that, like I wanna create things that can be in, in an environment and not just be you know, relegated to a wall or you know, stuffed in a folio. Um, and the material for me to do that at the time was clay. Um, so I was taking an AP, uh, I was taking an AP art class, chose sculpture, then clay was the material to work in. And pretty early on, just really took to the material. Like I loved working um, additively and subtractively. I worked mainly solid 
um, and then with hollow forms and uh, took an interest in sort of this bodily connection to the material um, and this bodily connection, I guess, you know, like how, the ways in which the material is sort of um, operated as a metaphor for the body in being, uh, in being clay. So this is one of my first pieces. Um, is this the right order? Do I have this right? I thought I had this. Oh, yeah, this is one of my first pieces. I ended up, um, as Betsy said, I, I, I bounced over to um, RISD, um, where as a ceramics major, I had to learn how to throw. I had done mainly um, sculpture work up until that time. Um, but really fell in love with the discipline of uh, the, the discipline of vessel making. Um, so once I learned how to throw, and I'll talk a little bit about vessels uh, later, um, just really became enamored um, with the canon of the the vase form, and kind of adapted my interest in that very sort of traditional canon uh, to working more um, dynamically and abstractly as I was with my sculpture work. Um, so here, I started, started exploring um, using, uh, what is it, a plasticine, oil-based clay, uh, to kind of take this, you know, very kind of simple form and twist it um, in space to produce what ended up, as the, as you can see in the middle, um, a slip cast a vase form. And um, I, I guess thinking about clay, I mean, there, there, there are a number of things that I'm going to touch on. But uh, at this stage, I found myself really kind of struggling with evidence of, of the hand. Um, what it means for there to be evidence both of the hand and also um, of the process in the work. And if you're familiar with the casting, you get seams in the work that I was constantly uh, fighting with um, and decided that eventually being able to 3D scan these pieces and then 3D print them um, would be the, the way to go. And it wasn't until, um, I, th I think I had that thing 3D scanned like right after undergrad, and it wasn't until I arrived at CCS like four years ago when I had a clay 3D printer of my own that I was actually able to realize the full arc of this dream. <laughs> and uh, I, remember, I remember, you know, just troubleshooting the piece and realizing that every bit of technology has its own sensitivities. Um, so the hand just, the, I guess the hand shifted to being sort of like a, a plotter. Um, and as far as like the sensitivities of uh, mold making and slip casting, I just kind of exchanged that for all of the sensitivities of troubleshooting a 3D printer, which you've worked with one. Um, Jolie's workshop just ended here. It can get pretty, can get pretty hairy. Um, and, but that hairiness was something that I was really drawn to. I, I, I saw it as a, as a problem, both in the case of you know, slip casting and then started to see it as a problem in the case of uh, 3D printing, but really came to appreciate the fact that like, the printer is just an extension of the hand and process is always present in some form. Uh, or another. We're talking a lot about the, the mold as a, as a matrix, and I was really drawn um, to this idea of the mold as being something that could reproduce objects um, with slip casting, and the 3D printer has the same uh, potential, but the meaning of that shifts with that process to what it means for something to be slip cast is kind of slightly different from what it means for it to be uh, 3D printed. The object has a very different kind of resonance uh, to and it was it was then that I started to kind of really delve into sort of this understanding of the mold as a matrix, but also um, process and this sense of touch um, across different processes as being sort of adaptations of that idea um, of um, of a matrix. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, professionally. Like after I graduated from undergrad, I was like, what am I going to do with a ceramics degree? But I was really fortunate. Um, that I had been following the work of uh, uh, Klein Reed, um, and I got an internship after college, and I ended up working for them. And it was a fantastic sort of introduction to what industry looks like with slip casting. That I, and I had no perspective of this whatsoever, um, and it was great um, seeing under James Klein and David Reed up there to the the, the, the upper left, um, just what it looked like to balance both being um, creatives, designers, as well as business people. I learned very quickly that I was a, I was a bad production person. <laughs> I just wanted to spend way too much time cleaning these beautiful forms. And I remember James was like, you can't do that. <laughs> like, there's a business. We have to like, run, run a business here. Um, I worked for them for uh, um, several months and ended up getting an opportunity to work for another artist, uh, Tom Otters, which was kind of the opposite. Um, of working for Klein Reed. What was great with, about working with Klein Reed is that I was, I was doing everything I'd studied, you know, I was slip casting, I was working with molds. 
um, the Tom Otterness, um, you know, like I was working, well, I was working with molded forms, I was working with clay, but I was working on like anywhere from medium to very large scale pieces. And instead of spending six minutes cleaning, you know, a pot, I'd spend um, a week or several weeks sanding a section of a sculpture, you know, before it'd go off to be cast in, uh, in bronze or another metal and then go off to either a big installation site um, or, an, or an exhibition space. And for me, it was a really great education of like, okay, this is what it looks like to be a production person. This is what it looks like to be a studio person. Um, but also it afforded the possibility for me to kind of think about translating the things I was doing in clay in another, in another material. Um, as much as I love clay, I felt like early on, I kind of really struggled with its sense of permanence, which is kind of an interesting thing because, you know, we're still digging up you know, pots, bowls, you know, things that have been made, you know, hundreds if not thousands of years ago from the earth, almost perfectly preserved because clay is very archival in that, in that way. But then, you know, you, you, you knock your favorite mug off a counter and it's gone, <laughs> it's completely gone. So there's this, you know, blend of its, the material's fragility, um, as well as its, you know, almost like indefinite archival nature that I'd always kind of struggled with and always kind of seen uh, clay's breakage and it's sort of, ability to fracture as a problem and, and thought of metal, of, of metal as being sort of like the way out. Okay, that's just the next thing to um, translate um, the kind of forms I was making in. But metal is probably even more sensitive than clay over time to, to, to breaking down. Um, but it was interesting for me giving myself that permission uh, to translate my clay works into um, metal. Um, yeah. yeah, and it was also interesting for me kind of thinking about the difference in process too. Um, so I would have to make a rubber mold of my original clay mold and then make a wax mold of that. And then if you know anything about the lost wax process, you have to sprig up your wax model just right and put a ceramic investment around it um, that you then fire, the wax melts out, and then you get the shell, and then you fill that. It's, it's just so layered. Um, and I found myself really drawn to that complexity. I guess I... You know, as a kid, I was, I was, I was, I was always in, into um, building and, you know, Legos and connects. And I guess there's something about sort of like the, com the, the layered complexity of mold making that really appealed to me. And eventually chasing metal also really appealed to me. And I learned that metal shrinks, it cracks, it does all these things that it wasn't supposed to do because clay does those things and metal shouldn't do those things too. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a great sort of um, education around materiality. Um, it was around this time that I, well, I would say about grad school, um, that I made one of my first press molds, and we were talking about press molds a lot um, in, the, in the workshop. And I remember thinking to myself that I wanted to be able to make objects of, of volume um, efficiently and trying to kind of think through different processes of um, achieving that. And specifically with mold making, I mean, I've talked about um, mold making as it relates to slip casting, which is usually in reference to industry. Um, and then mold making in reference to the development of sculpture pieces for like, you know, an exhibition, um, which is usually just, usually just about sort of having to translate the material through different phases in order to get to the final thing. Um, in this case, I knew that I wanted to really investigate this form entitled Animus Ori, just kind of thinking um, of sort of, uh, I guess, traditions of, like spiritual traditions of animism in the country where I'm from, so Nigeria. Um, not really resonating sort of with the spiritual practice, but really with the aesthetic sort of elements, like the texture, the forms. I wanted to kind of give myself the permission to explore those, um, but really by being able to duplicate this form, thinking about the space in between, um, as well as what the objects that I was making also was, was, was saying. So it's almost like you get to see the object twice where you make the thing, and then by making multiples of the thing, you create this community that also has its own kind of um, dialogue. And I was, I, was, I was immediately both um, excited about this process, um, while recognized that there were kind of certain things I needed to troubleshoot through it. So you can't escape process, <laughs> you, know, you can't escape it. Um, so just kind of on deconstructing, I'm kind of doing this for the benefit of my students who are in the, in the audience. Um, I talked about line to start with, um, and sort of my frustrations with line that led me to working with clay. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to be able to draw in space when I kind of produce this model. But that's what I did. I took some wire, I stapled it to a board, and I just started kind of like, started with one line and then just kind of filled it out into 
this form that I used a mesh tape to create a, a surface around. On top of that, applied some plaster and then finished it off with clay to produce this model. So clay is present and active here, but it's active as sort of a, a, an in-between material, something that gets me to the, the thing. So it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting making the model and looking at it in clay and knowing that that's not the thing, that the thing has yet to happen because I still need to make the mold. Um, and the mold itself becomes this whole other process. Um, in this case, a two-part mold. I think I started off as a four-part mold because I was really kind of concerned about what seemed like its complexity. Um, so what you do is you essentially just divide your mold into two parts as I have, create a wall, lather plaster and burlap on both sides, pop them open, um, put a, a slab into that mold once it's done, um, slip and score the edges, seal it back together, and you have your piece. You have essentially something that looks pretty close to your original. And with this, decided to create a little bit of an internal structure to give it a little bit more um, strength. So this was really my first large-scale sculptural press mold, and I kind of knew that I was on to something <laughs> from, from there. Um, I never really lost my roots, though, as far as being a hand builder. Like, I'd always worked solid um, because I just really enjoyed the ability to kind of go in or go out, you know, um, with a block of clay, having no limitations um, around what it is you could do. Um, and at a certain point, realized that um, coil building allowed or kind of presented an opportunity to also really capture a lot of volume, but pretty efficiently without having to hollow anything out without having to create um, a, a mold. So the jump for me from either mold making or working solid was pretty significant, but also um, really powerful in how it kind of led to this series. Um, so this is a piece titled Big Head. Um, Big Head was actually my father's nickname for me as a, as a kid, uh, <laughs> not the sweetest uh, nickname. Um, and something odd happened when I turned, like I, I, thought I, I, didn't, I never thought I looked anything like my father growing up, and as soon as I turned 30, I was like, I look just like this, this person. Um, my father, unfortunately, passed away due to COVID. Um, this was like April 2020, and it was also around that time that um, the nation was really kind of reeling and responding to the killings of George Floyd, um, as well as the killings of a, a number of you know unarmed men. Um, I started to really kind of, and I'm, I'm black men, I started to really kind of think of my own identity as a black man, um, both being a black person and being a man, and realizing that so much of that has been shaped by my father. I didn't really grow up being very close to my father. I, I got closer to him um, right before he passed away just by having conversations. Um, but this piece was almost like a way for me to both grieve his passing, kind of reflect on this, like, um, almost this overlap that we have in identity just because we look so similar to one another, um, but also this reflection on what it means for me to understand my sense of identity through both his nurturing, his experience, his eyes, his whatever, in a way that I hadn't really quite um, before. Um, this piece, along with a few others, were included um, in an exhibition that was curated by Glenn Adamson at Friedman Bentley Gallery in New York City titled A New Realism. Um, and it was an opportunity for me, kind of going back to thoughts on my culture, uh, to think of what realism is. From a Western standpoint, from a European standpoint, um, we can think of, or we might think of realism as being sort of mimicking what the eye sees to, to, to the closest degree of possibility. Whereas from a West African standpoint, what is real um, is more about sort of meaning and value. So you convey um, in form, in line, in sort of the representation of, thing, of, of a thing. Um, what value or meaning says uh, is localized in certain kind of parts of, you know, be it a figure, an animal, um, about what matters to you or, or about what matters to that culture. For that reason, in Yoruba culture, typically the head is oversized because it's believed to be the seat of a soul. So whenever you see a Yoruba, like a Yoruba statuette, the head is usually going to be um, pretty, pretty large. Um, pretty, pretty outsized. Um, and this is an opportunity for me to kind of return back to the um, mold. So I, I saw in this portrait series a real opportunity to both investigate um, identity further as well as culture further, but kind of a problem because I couldn't, I didn't have the capacity to coil build a bunch of these kind of like um, base forms. Um, here you can see, so Akonzo is my uh, father's last name before he changed it uh, when he got married. 
Um, I started creating this large koala built model and decided that I would then produce a press, press mold of it, probably the largest, I don't know what I was thinking. Well, I do know what I was thinking. It was the largest press mold I've ever made. Um, it's right at the limit of what I can manage at my physical ability <laughs> right now. It's a three-part mold, again, kind of a similar process to the one that I showed where I kind of divided this form up into three sections, would lay clay slabs into the cavity of the mold, um, would kind of scissor in the, the final piece, and then just kind of use that shape as a canvas um, for this series, each one of the pieces having sort of a different articulation of facial features, um, a different articulation of sort of like textures that represented um, this kind of blend um, or this kind of like a, a both a blend and I would say also a migration of identity that I share with my father. So we're talking about James Baldwin uh, in our workshop um, as well. And I mean, I, I love the essay, The Creative Process, and this is one of the things we've been uh, discussing. I kind of think about, I guess, the, the, the role of the um, artist, and I, I love the way James says, like, you know, like birth, suffering, love, and death. And I, I had the, you know, I was, I was on vacation with my family about three weeks ago. And I remember thinking to myself, we're all here gathered, having a good time as in Jamaica. You know, five years from now, this will be really different. You know, my, my oldest niece is 14. Five years from now, she'll be in college and maybe have a boyfriend. And five years from now, maybe somebody might be sick. Five years from now, maybe there might be, I, I, like, we have, I, we have no clue. Um, but, <laughs> in, in that moment, we're just eating lots of food and drinking <laughs> and just having fun. We're not thinking about all of those things. And I kind of had this point where I was like, oh yeah, I'm like there, there, there's, there's, a, there's a really kind of strong contrast that time can bring to this dynamic um, that we have that I have kind of have to choose not to think about. But as an artist, I can really investigate. As an artist, I can really kind of wrestle with in a way that just wouldn't be appropriate you know, at Hibachi in Jamaica with my family, <laughs> um, which is kind of the license that we have as creative individuals to kind of do this work um, ourselves, to kind of wrestle with what it means to, yeah, be alive, to die, to suffer, um, et cetera. So these are my two nieces here, my youngest niece to the left, and then my oldest uh, niece to the right, and then my mom um, over there. Um, I think they're just right outside of a church service. And I think a lot about what it means to kind of pass on knowledge, especially through different uh, generations. Um, I guess with that, specifically as it relates to my mother, so I haven't been back to Nigeria since I was born. Um, and I think a lot about what it would be to go back. I was actually kind of just discussing this at lunch. And um, I'm mainly American. I know that when I go back home, like, you know, or go back to Nigeria, people will see me as, as, as such. Um, but I love the way this tension is described by Glenn Ligon, one of my favorite artists. So he says, I went to Africa, I went to the motherland to find my roots, right? 700 million black people, not one of those motherfuckers knew me. And I'm like, that's gonna be the experience I have. And I'm not like, I don't know, I'm not conflicted about it in any way. I just know it's gonna be significant and important for me to experience that. Um, I guess I'll end with this last slide. I believe this is about 20 minutes. Um, this last slide, this is my studio in Detroit. I was also talking about um, Detroit during, during lunch and specifically the ways in which it's a nurturing place for me as an artist and creative to be. I've always been drawn to the history of the city um, as being sort of like a center of manufacturing um, a center um, both for the migration of black people and people of color, as well as the site of you know the riots that um, you know affected and blighted the city the way it has for so uh, for so long, but also a particularly unique place where I, you know, as a teacher and an artist, could you know get a home, think of it primarily as my art studio, and create a creative life uh, there. So this is in the basement. When I bought the home, I immediately went to the basement and was looking for moisture because I knew that was going to be where I'd be. Um, working and you know it's pretty small it's pretty modest there are a lot of I don't know OSHA violations in there <laughs> like I don't think there are any windows but it's such a special place for me like Detroit and my studio um, being sort of like this locus of where I'm able to create where I'm able to kind of wrestle um, with the kinds of ideas that I've described earlier of what it what it means to understand my sense of history my sense of identity and also what it means to kind of think moving forward I'll end it there thank you
Thank you, Abby. Our next speaker is Del Haro. Del Haro lives and works in Fort Collins, Colorado with his wife, Potter Sanam Imami, and their son, William. He is an associate professor at Colorado State University, where he teaches sculpture, digital fabrication, and ceramics. His art practice spans genres of sculpture and design and integrates traditional manual and skill-based forming processes with digital fabrication technology. His work has been exhibited at the Milwaukee Art Museum, the Denver Art Museum, the Arizona State University Art Museum, Vox Populi Gallery in Philly, and the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. He is represented by Haw Contemporary in Kansas City, Missouri, and Harvey Meadows Gallery in Aspen, Colorado. In 2020, Harrow received a United States Artist Fellowship unrestricted award celebrating artists and culture practitioners who have significantly contributed to the creative landscape and art ecosystems of the country. Please join me in welcoming Dell to the podium. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, thank you for that introduction, Betsy. Um, and thanks uh, to Andrea and Liz and everyone else for having me back to teach at Anderson Ranch. Um, I'm teaching here in the Advanced Mentored Studies course, uh, The Ceramic Matrix with Ebby. And Ebby, it's been such an honor teaching with you this last week. Um, I've been teaching here at the ranch for about 10 years now this summer, the first workshop um, was a digital fabrication and clay workshop uh, that I taught back in 2013. So it's, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing to be invited to teach here at the ranch, but even more remarkable, I think, to be invited to teach back. Um, and the, my relationship with the ranch has meant a great deal to me. It's one of the most wonderful places to teach, I think, um, thanks to Betsy and Joanne. It's just an incredible amount of support in the, in the studio, and I just find it to be a really rich rich environment to teach in. Um, it's been also um, just hugely inspiring this last week um, to be in the studio with the cohort of students in the Advanced Mentored Studies program. Um, I've really been inspired by your talent and generosity. Um, this time has had me really thinking a lot about teaching and mentorship. And I often say this thing that I learn as much from my students as they learn from me. And uh, I think here, you know, that's really, truly, truly the case. Um, I think one of the amazing things about being an artist is that we're continually learning um, and from everything all around us. Um, I'm from Oregon originally, I grew up there. Um, and now I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. I live there with my wife, Sanam. Uh, Amami and my son William. Um, Sonam is a potter, and uh, together we are the pottery program. We are the faculty of the pottery program at Colorado State University. And um, it's really this amazing thing to have a life with another artist. Um, her work is really different from mine in many ways, but I'm just continually learning from her. Um, you'll see in the work we share a palette of glazes. Um, Sanam is from Iran. Her work draws a lot of inspiration um, from pattern and geometry from the Islamic world and from the Silk Road. Um, I've learned a tremendous amount from her about structure, about form, about pattern, about geometry, um, but also deeper things, um, lessons about uh, care and tending, about gardening. Um, William has also been a great teacher of mine. Um, this is a Komodo dragon. And then the body's like this big. And then look at the tail. Drooping, the head's drooping too. And then look at the tail. Here are the feet. And then I put texture on it. This, and before I made a Komodo dragon, I had to hollow it out. Then I got mad at my mom. But then I did my mom's strategy. So this is the... So this is the second one. And I So you'll see from the images, um, I'm a, I tend to be a sort of slow, fairly careful, meticulous maker. And I've learned so much from William about a kind of a boldness and urgency uh, when he comes into the studio. Um, 
This is just a short video. I actually just took this today. I drove home to be with Sonam and William for the weekend, and uh, as I was leaving town, I took a quick video of my studio in Fort Collins. I was fortunate enough, enough to build this space um, a few uh, years ago. I feel incredibly lucky. Um, so here's just a quick video of what's happening in the studio right now. Um, there are a number of different things that kind of organize and frame my practice as an artist. Um, I work in a number of different materials. I use some metal, um, mostly specifically aluminum, um, some wood in the work, uh, but I mostly work in clay and ceramics. And I think of myself as a ceramic artist, um, both in the sense that I primarily use clay, but the work is also um, very much about clay. Um, I also, over the last 15 years or so, have spent a lot of time thinking about technology. Um, and uh, I think about technology not as something that's just happening right now, just emerging, um, not even something that just means tools or machines, um, but really the long continuum of ceramic technology. So the potter's wheel is a technology as well as a 3D printer. Um, I think there's a kind of continuum of different kinds of artists, artists who you know, have an idea and find a material or process to express that idea. And then maybe on the other side of this continuum, artists whose ideas grow out of material and process, um, artists who really think through materials and process, processes. And I would say I tend to be more in that latter group. Um, I think through material and process. Um, I think of the work as emerging out of a kind of confluence of idea, material, form, and processes. Um, so I'm gonna jump ahead to kind of three projects that I made between about 2010 and 2018. And each of these pieces is made in a similar way. Um, I begin with uh, computer-aided design software and um, use this design software in combination with a computer-controlled milling machine uh, to create a plaster mold. Um, so in a sense, each of these pieces are about ceramics and molds as a technology. And like any technology, the mold gives certain structures. Um, one is about repetition. Another is about how to make something large from many parts. Um, so again, I design the work in, computer -aided, in a computer-aided design software and then either carve plaster directly using a computer-controlled milling machine, or as in this case, um, I mill a foam prototype that I then cast plaster from. But in every case, the digital and mechanical work is paired with a really significant amount of handwork. Um, this isn't just a requirement of the process, but it's also really important to the way I think about the content of the work. So this is a large wall piece that was commissioned for a, um, a, an apartment building lobby in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, it's made up of 170 of these hand-pressed tiles, and there are um, actually 10 different molds here so it's one pattern, but the geometry kind of compresses as you move from the top to the bottom. And then the glaze is actually um, about eight different glazes, um, a really subtle line blend. So there's a transition from a white glaze at the top um, to a light kind of turquoise blue glaze at the bottom. Um, so again, I think one of these ideas that's very much germane to thinking about molds and making work with molds uh, is this idea about repetition and variation, um, ideas about tiling, ideas about how you make something large from many repeated smaller parts. Um, this is a second piece, kind of thinking through a similar idea, um, but instead of just tiling in two dimensions, this is about building a form that tiles or tessellates in three dimensions. So it begins with this um, shape, a geometric shape called a space-filling polyhedron. And then using computer-aided design software, I kind of soften the hard, faceted geometry. And then there's a process of kind of searching within this um, for one element, one unit that can be cast over and over again 
to repeat the overall or to create the overall shape. So I kind of break that fairly complicated shape down and then break it down again into the parts of a mold. And then this is a short video of just casting those units, those elements. So I'm pouring slip into the molds. This is the slip casting process. Um, I made a bunch of these molds. I can't remember how many. It's about a five part mold. You pour this liquid slip into the mold and um, it's, as, it, uh, as it dries, it forms a thin shell on the edges of the mold. A beautiful thing about slip casting, um, when you, you just paint a little bit of slip on the surfaces and they connect together really beautifully. So here I'm kind of looking for um, an element that kind of strikes a balance between being a piece that's stackable, um, has sort of a structure to it, and that it can be stacked vertically, but also that isn't too large to move around and stack into the kiln. Those pieces are cast and stacked here, and then they keep sort of growing out and out into larger and larger configurations. And then one last um, piece about molds and mold making. Um, this is a piece called uh, Breath. And this piece is about this idea that I think is very pervasive in ceramics, this idea of the pot or the vessel as a kind of metaphor for the body. Um, people talk about the lip of the pot or the belly of the pot or the shoulder of the pot. And they also talk about the breath of a pot. And um, so I was thinking here about this idea of turning that breath of a pot from something static or fixed in one object to something dynamic, um, something moving, and to also in this process try to make the mold from something fixed into something dynamic or moving. Um, so the idea here was to make a whole series of slip cast vessels, but using one plaster mold so I made this first mold by directly carving the plaster on the computer-controlled milling machine and then casting the mold and then putting it back on the milling machine and carving it again and casting it again and carving it again and casting it again. In the sense, it's like a woodblock print um, where you destroy each mold through the next milling process. This is an image in the studio um, of all these pieces that all came out of this one mold. And then here's the final series. Here. So as much as each of these last pieces, I hope express an optimism about technology. Um, technology is something uh, something like a kind of organic hybrid of hands and machines um, with the capacity to think in open ways and create beautiful things. Um, and I'm most interested in technology that we can engage in this way, to engage with technology like gardening, um, to engage with technology in a way that takes time and care. But I'm also, of course, cognizant of the darker sides of technology, and instrumentalizing matter um, and this even includes ceramic technology. And over the last few years, I've been collecting um, examples of clay and ceramics that has been made into weapons, um, which of course is another kind of technology. So one of these, which is maybe the strangest of the pointer works up here on the left, um, and maybe in the sense, the most beautiful weapon, um, if there is such a thing, um, comes from the west coast of the United States in Oregon State, um, near, near where I grew up. Um, and this is a strange artifact. Um, it was a shard of porcelain from the Santo Cristo de Burgos um, Spanish shipwreck from 1687. 
and the shard of porcelain washed up on the beach. Uh, and then it was found by the Nehalem and Tillamook residents of the Oregon coast. And like obsidian, um, it was napped into an arrowhead. Um, this is an example also of the way in which ceramics is fluid, um, is continually being borrowed and remade across cultures. Uh, the second example is darker somehow, um, and it's what's known as a type four grenade or a ceramic grenade. Um, it's also known as a uh, last ditch hand grenade. And this was developed by the Imperial Japanese Navy at the closing stages of World War II. Um, this is just an excerpt from a, a, a text about that. By late 1944 and early 1945, much of the industrial infrastructure of Japan had been destroyed by Allied strategic bombing, and there was a growing shortage of raw materials due to Allied naval blockades and submarine lit warfare lacking in metals to mass produce hand grenades in the vast quantities that would be needed against the protected allied invasion, the Imperial Japanese Navy developed a design for a cheap, easy to make grenade of ceramic or porcelain materials. Kilns famous for the production of traditional Japanese pottery, such as Arita, Bizen, and Seto, were pressed into service to manufacture these relatively crude weapons. And then finally, on the bottom, these are clay balls um, from an archaeological site known as uh, Tel Hamakar, and they're from about 4,000 BC um, in southern Mesopotamia, um, modern-day Syria. And these are um, examples of the earliest archaeological evidence of organized warfare. Um, so the weapons were these clay balls, and I think these are incredible things, the way you can see the fingerprints pressed, pressed into the clay, the kind of urgency of um, pressing this material into service as a weapon. Um, but in each of these cases, the ceramic material is hardened and compacted, and perhaps this is a metaphor for the way in which technology can also harden our thinking. By contrast, as we know, clay as a material can also be stretched and expanded. It can hold volume. It can allow for thinking that is poetic, expansive, and voluminous. And here are three examples of clay as another kind of ceramic technology, the vessel, um, which we're really very familiar with. These were pots that were used not only for sustenance, for cooking and holding food, but were also ritual burial objects. Um, sorry, I'm gonna move along. I think I'm running out of time. So the title of our workshop, as Ebby mentioned, is The Clay Matrix. And this is a really interesting word with multiple meanings. Um, it means both a mold, but also earth or fertile soil from which crops issue forth. Um, in this sense, the matrix shares a root word with both matter and also mother or maternal. Matrix can also be a womb. In this sense, the matrix is a kind of a vessel. The clay vessel is an archetypal metaphor for the abstract ideas like fertility or the body but as much as physical material, metaphors are technologies for thinking in complex and expansive ways about ineffable aspects of our humanity. They can also be reductive. Things become too rigid containers, bodies, identities, or nations. The vessel as a metaphor for the body might reduce understanding of the mutability of identity and the changing nature of the physical body. In the same way, describing a nation as a melting pot emphasizes assimilation and homogeneity over the fullness of difference and variation. So over the last few years, I've been working on this series of vessels, um, which I think in a sense are just trying to complicate the idea of the ceramic container. And this first one is called Klein, and this is based on 
actually a mathematical idea about a kind of hypothetical container called a Klein bottle. Um, this is a category of forms among a category of forms called a non-orientable surface or non-orientable geometry. So like a Mobius strip is another one of these. And if you kind of look at this form, if you were to fill it with liquid on the inside, um, that liquid would then pour out of the outside. So the outside surface becomes the inside surface. This is a second form called Maplethorpe. Um, it's kind of based loosely on a photograph by Robert Maplethorpe. And it came as a kind of image or vision of this vessel, um, which in order to stand needed to extend its interior surface out. So the interior surface perforates the front of the vessel and becomes a kind of prop or a stand. This is a form called Vignelli, which was based loosely on this um, cup design by the designers Leila and Massimo Vignelli. This piece is called Simmel, um, based kind of loosely on an essay by the um, early 20th century sociologist Georg Simmel. And finally, this piece, um, which over time I've come to call the Wad Kuvad. And this is a piece which I made over a period of about nine months. Um, and during the same period of time, my wife was carrying our son, William. And um, this is a vessel or container. It's not made out of ceramic. It's made out of aluminum. Um, and this term kuvad is a term from anthropology for a whole range of rituals by which, uh, through which men try to um, uh, account for, make sense of, in some cases, I try to take credit for the birth of children. <laughs> but I just think about it as something, a kind of extended meditation on the ways in which um, something really large and significant can issue forth from something very small. So it began as this little um, wad of aluminum foil that I swept up in the corner of the studio one day and then for whatever reason didn't throw this material away. It was a curiosity in it. Um, at about the same time, um, our son was born after um, a long series of struggles with fertility and we ended up actually uh, using, um, taking advantage of the generosity of an egg donor to have our son. And um, so we actually bore witness to his first cells growing in a Petri dish. Um, so this was a long process of slowly, meticulously taking a 3D scan of that wad of aluminum foil and unfolding it digitally and then figuring out how to reassemble that material. So um, there are score lines, uh, annotations for the fold angle of every one of these facets. It was all folded by hand um, and then riveted together by hand from the inside um, over a period of about two days, uh, not sleeping really at all. Um, and um, I think that's about time, so I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. All right, we'll have a quick q and I actually have a first question. It's a very practical question. As a fellow mold maker, what do you do with all of your molds? <laughs> How do you know when you're done with them? Uh, um, well, uh, an interesting story. Um, when I moved to San Francisco from Michigan, um, I hired a terrible moving company <laughs> and uh, they proceeded to put my belongings in storage which I asked them to do and then the driver who did this uh, quit 
So my, if you ever watched Storage Wars, that's essentially, that's essentially what happened to everything. So my molds, all of my property. And it was devastating. And I remember I, for a moment I was like, I lost everything and I lost my molds. And I was like, I lost my molds. <laughs> you know? And I had a lot. I had uh, a lot of really big molds, like a big mold library over the years that I kind of hung on to. And I guess I have trouble letting go of my molds. You know, I have trouble destroying them. Um, certain ones, maybe not so much, but over the years, definitely had built, built up a, a, a number of them. And uh, it was really nice for a minute to say, I have to start over, and I get to start over. So, so barring having somebody abscond <laughs> and having them just, you know, taken from, and, and eventually I was able to track down, um, oddly enough, you know, all my belongings and specifically my molds. So I, was, I was like, I was so concerned that somebody's gonna be out there like making my work. And then I was like, <laughs> who else wants to do that? <laughs> it's like, no. So I, I got all the molds back, they're back in my life. And so I, I now still have that question of what I'm gonna do with them. I'll just burden my family members with them one day when I die, so. <laughs> <laughs> that, I love the idea, though, of someone stealing all your molds, and it's like a, a hyper-specific bootleg paint-your-own-pottery uh, <laughs> establishment. Um, uh, I uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a thing, isn't it, Betsy? Oh yeah. I have a lot of old molds. I've been trying to kind of put a I don't know. I feel like there should be like you should be forced to stamp like a use-by date on your molds. Um, something kind of interesting I found out recently, I actually learned this from a former student who was doing some research on sustainability um, with Julia Galloway at University of Montana. Did you know this, that apparently it's bad to throw molds like in a landfill? Um, there's something about the way they break down or don't break down in an anaerobic environment, but apparently they're really good, uh, good soil additive for dense soil, so I've been trying to do that with them more. Um, I also have been recycling old shards in another way. I've been mixing them into concrete and casting things out of them. So I've been looking for ways of the studio feeling more circular. I mm -hmm. think that's really important. Um, I don't know. I think anything like that where you can find a way of thinking about that that then sort of liberates the practice Great, th thank you. Yeah, I'm still thinking about how what to do with all my molds. Are there any other questions? Did you ever consider doing a Klein bottle on a wheel? Um. I tried a couple times. It's really did you, hard. How did it go? Not very well. Oh. Getting well, the bottom to go far enough without falling over was really hard. Thank you for doing that work for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I won't try it now. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, just wondered. Yeah, no, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I hadn't really. I think a lot of the pieces, you know, there's kind of a specific thought about, you know, you're working with a certain process for a while and then the image of the Klein bottle comes up and I was sort of deep in this one mold making process at the time. So it wasn't so much about just making a Klein bottle um, as with a lot of the work. I think it was sort of a thought about making a Klein bottle in that particular way. Um, so the form, it actually starts with what's called a parametric model. So as you're modeling it in the computer, rather than just making one shape, you kind of model it with a series of sliders so you can make lots of different yeah. variations of possible <laughs> Klein bottles. So there was something sort of quite specific about making it that, that way, but I love the idea. I don't know, it's such a, I, I feel like the Klein bottle should be another one of those like pottery standards, <laughs> like, you know, like a, like a tea bowl or a chawan or a pitcher, Klein bottle should be one of them. Yeah, it's just hard to raise the bottom up far enough to where it pierces the side high enough up and then still maintain the overall shape. I just wondered if you tried it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Hi, I just have a technical question, which is, um, are you using Grasshopper for your parametric modeling or something else? Yeah, yeah, using okay. Grasshopper, yeah. 
it's a software application. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, uh, it's, like, a, it's like a visual programming language. So it's kind of easier. It's good for people like myself who struggle with um, coding, like writing lines of code. And you sort of like, I, sometimes I show pictures of the user interface, but you kind of like plug components together to build your model. It's a little bit hard to describe, but it's like an, an easier way of writing a program. It's kind of like programming with training wheels. Uh. Okay, I had a technical question before, or a practical one. Now I have a philosophical one. So each of you are working with molds, and it's not in the the interest of necessarily making multiples. You're using those molds as a way to kind of explore a form over and over again. Can you talk a little bit more about how you, how you might, when you work with a mold, how, are there any discoveries beyond that mold when you make that form that lead to the next work? Yeah, <laughs> no, for sure. Um, well, yeah, the, the, the mold is a, it's an interesting kind of contract, um, but it's also one that kind of lends itself to being broken or adapted just because it's also there for that. You know, you're not just reproducing the same thing over and over again. It becomes this, um, almost like this landscape of possibility, you know, where, yes, you know, I'm, I'm creating multiples to, investigate this idea of you know space in between and, and, and how the multiple sort of um, kind of changes the meaning of, of, of the singular. Um, but also there is this really wonderful um, opportunity to kind of kind of break the mold <laughs> to, to, to literally um, break the mold or, or, or to see sort of that interior space um, as a space of possibility where you can break your own rules um, by the way you press molds, layer clay into a mold. Um, layer different materials even into a mold. Um, just kind of really challenge your expectations because you have that freedom. Like the mold sort of allows that freedom in a way where if you were just making something one-off, um, this, this sense of burden to labor, even though you might have a similar burden to labor, um, you know, with making something one-off, there just seems to be an openness, a levity there that lends to that kind of experimentation, that lends to uh, thinking iteratively, and, and it's, it's, it's almost a loss if you don't try. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go through the, the, the labor of creating this thing that you're gonna have to live with for a very long time and just make a bunch of the same thing and don't take the opportunity to really play um, with what's possible through it. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, I think, I think, you know, molds are both often about making, like, making work, making the same form over and over again, but they also do other things, you know, like like we've been working on in the studio, kind of making a mold that only deals with the bottom of a form. And so a mold can be a way of um, making a form that sort of lifts off of the table, that isn't sort of bound by the relationship between gravity, clay, and the flat surface of a table, you know. So um, uh, a mold can kind of like elevate a form. And there are all sorts of like f kinds of forms, I think, that one can, you know, create, maybe not only create, but create more easily using a mold. I also think a mold is like, you know, it's like the idea of creativity within limitations or limits. So I think a mold, you know, all these things are technologies, right? Or you can think of them as technologies. You can think of, um, uh, uh, a mold is a technology, but also language is a technology, maybe. You can think about um, the way in which, you know, we organize musical notes, right, music. You can think about that. So they're, they're structures, and I think a mold's very much like that. It's kind of a, a framework. It's a set of limitations, right, to, to work inside of. Um, so in the same way that as a musician, you might give yourself a key signature to work with, you know. Mm. The mold is that limitation which also generates ideas and possibilities. Yeah, most of the time people think of them as being rigid. You know, a mold is a rigid, especially a plaster mold. But I've found that they're quite, the outcomes can be quite 
you know, you can explore a lot of different outcomes. All right. There. Like, oh. molds are only rigid once you're done with them. <laughs> uh, so, like, the mold sort of exists as this idea um, in your head that seems anything but rigid, you know, when you're, I don't know, lathering on plaster, <laughs> you know, and it's getting everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, or when you're like, you know, whether it be another material too, like, cause you can make molds out of resin and, and rubber. Um, you know, this kind of rigidity um, is something that almost exists in the brain first and then kind of comes to the mold, like after you've gone through uh, a, a number of steps. So it's kind of like a, a set of limitations that you define. Um, almost like recognizing the significance of having limitations um, in the way in which you kind of build form or kind of build a set of rules to create um, a form. And there is something both really comforting, um, really important, but also really liberating in being able to define those parameters for yourself and then just kind of go really, I don't, know, I don't want to say crazy, but maybe crazy like within them. Yeah. Right on. If that's all, thank you very much, Del and Abby. We'll see you all folks tomorrow.